Australia, as well as all of you. Uh, I was just telling the High Commissioner uh, uh, that uh, ISAS has very good working relation with, with Australian think tanks, universities, etc. And we have fielded very recently a couple of visits to Australia. Uh, Doug Chester was uh, earlier uh, a Deputy Secretary at the Department of For DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, when he was um, concurrently ambassador to, to, uh, to APEC. Uh, he had also uh, been High Commissioner to Brunei and had served in Washington. I was also informed that uh, uh, he was at the Australian National University, to which uh, you chair. <coughs> Uh, you sincerely also belong, uh, uh, contributing to the growing consensus that it's the best university in the world. <laughs> uh, however, uh, to, <laughs> to many in South Asia, Australia conjures up uh, many images uh, of endless land, arid land, and, and uh, well, uh, everyone knows the kookaburras and kangaroos of Donald uh, 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 Bradman and Yvonne Bulladong, those of us who are into tennis, uh, or Patrick White uh, uh, or, or Joan Sutherland. What uh, Donald Horn had once called the lucky country, but uh, uh, as you know, that uh, there's meant to be a more uh, of irony into the name than, than is implied in the title itself. Anyway, what he called the lucky country produces heroes at the same time it also chops off the tall poppy. Uh, that's a very Australian characteristic which we in the subcontinent, we in South Asia, find very fascinating. As Asia is re-emerging today, as it, uh, uh, I mean, and uh, this is being uh, recognized uh, on the global ma matrix, the components of Asia, the two uh, subcontinents, Australia continent, as a matter of fact, and South, South Asia, uh, there's a felt need among us to uh, know one another uh, better uh, so that we can have greater mutually profitable uh, interactions. Uh, today, uh, High Commissioner Chester will speak to a very important subject, which is Australia's uh, relations with, with South Asia. Uh, the two, Australia and South Asia, are tied by, by uh, many commonalities, including uh, Commonwealth values, of course, and, and cricket, as we are all aware. Uh, and yet, uh, 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 Professor uh, Robin Jeffrey has called uh, this relationship puzzling. Puzzling, I mean, uh, and he, uh, he argues that there's a, uh, there's a missing link, uh, which is uh, travails and travels of peoples, and not in so many words. Uh, we are hoping that uh, High Commissioner uh, Chester will speak to those issues. He'll speak about uh, politics and peoples and trade and commas and uranium and give us also a solution of Australian perspectives to the solution of the of problems in Afghanistan. <laughs> so with those few words, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dr. Chowdhury, and I'd like to thank the Institute for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here this afternoon. And uh, let me start by just uh, making a few, uh, I guess, introductory comments about, uh, I guess, about the region itself. But, uh, the South Asian region is a region of significance to, to Australia. It's of significant economic and security interest to Australia. It's the fastest growing region in the world, and we see that from the GDP uh, figures for countries like India running at about 9%, and uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka at around uh, 6 and 7%. It's also the home for, home for one fifth of the world's population. Um, and our Australia's goods and services trade with, uh, with the region last year in 2010 was over 20 billion Australian dollars. We have very, very strong people-to-people -people links and they've developed over decades of, uh, uh, as hundreds of thousands of people from South Asia have made Australia their home. What I'd like to do more generally in this presentation is to map out how South Asia fits within Australia's broader foreign and trade policy settings. And of course, a key part of that story is uh, is the relation, our relationship with India, and uh, how we re we are responding to the rise of India. Uh, India, after all, is the world's largest democracy and undeniably the economic powerhouse for, uh, for South Asia. Our um, 
Australia's foreign policy settings also recognise that South Asia is a crucial staging point for confronting some of the more significant and toughest global challenges. Challenges such as um, uh, poverty, the effects of climate change, terrorism, piracy and uh, people smuggling. In March this year, our Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd gave a speech in Perth titled The Commonwealth of Nations, Australia and the 21st Century. Now the main purpose of that speech was, uh, was in the lead up to uh, the Commonwealth Heads of uh, Government meeting that was held in Perth in late October this year. But the speech was also uh, significant for elaborating on the shift that's been taking place for some time now in Australian, Australia's foreign policy settings. And that is, the shift is that Australia is increasingly acknowledging that it is both a country of the Indian Ocean and a country of the Pacific Ocean. We are a two, uh, two ocean nation, not a one nation ocean, and not a one ocean nation, as uh, Mr Rudd said. This look west policy, if you like, that's what you want to call it, is about Australia acknowledging the need to do more in South Asia, in Africa and in the Middle East in the pursuit of our national interests and pursuit of Australia's national interests. And as I said earlier, it's fair to say that India plays a, a, a large part in that and it's one of the primary factors driving this recalibration of Australia's foreign uh, policy focus from the Asia-Pacific to the Indo-Pacific, as, as Mr Rudd called it. Last Thursday, uh, uh, Mr Rudd spoke at length at the Australian foreign policy, on Australian foreign policy at the Australian Institute of International Affairs in, uh, in Canberra. And in his comments uh, last week, Mr Rudd outlined 10 key aspects of Australia's vision for its place in the world. And I just want to mention the first three of those. Uh, uh, the first one was to entrench our standing, Australia's standing, as a middle power with global interests and regional interests. The second was to preserve the peace, stability and security of the Asia-Pacific region by building the principles of common security through the institutions of our region. And the third, uh, the, the, third, the third element of the vision was to build new cooperative institutions to support the peace and stability of the Indian Ocean region recognising that we are a nation of two oceans, not one, and the, and the Indian Ocean will become as significant as the Pacific in the century ahead. And it was in this context that, uh, that we can explain Foreign, Ministers Rudd, Foreign Minister Rudd's attendance and very active participation in the Council of Ministers meeting of IRAC, the Indian Ocean Room Association of Regional Countries, IRAC, that was hosted in India uh, in the middle of last month, in, on the 15th of November, just two weeks ago. IRAC is a key regional forum which enables Australia uh, to engage closely with India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Singapore and other states with vital interests in the, in the, in the Indian Ocean. And uh, Mr Rudd's presence was the first time in 15 years that Australia had been represented at foreign minister level at, the, at an IRAC meeting. And uh, Mr Rudd acknowledged this and at the same time called upon IRAC members, IRAC member states to also ensure that, that foreign ministers' engagement was increased across the board with a, with a view to revitalising the group, the grouping, revitalising IRAC. Through a number of public statements, Mr Rudd also called for greater focus on the potential of IRAC. Given the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean, uh, the, the region, the Indian Ocean region, whether in terms of energy security, trade flows or fish stocks, Australia wants to work with others of the region to see IRAC revitalised and strengthened as a key element of regional architecture. And uh, he noted that with India as the current chair, followed by Australia chairing after India and then Indonesia, that uh, the time was right to have six years of, uh, of good leadership to further develop and reform the long-term agenda of, uh, of IRA. Um, and Australia's push for a revitalised revitalised IRA is also about engaging at a level that befits our relative political and economic stature our stature in this part of the world, in the Pacific and in the, uh, and in the Indian Ocean. Our secretary, the secretary of our department, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, made the point uh, recently that uh, Australia is not as small as we like to think of ourselves. And I think that is, uh, 
very much uh, the, the, a view that Australians have, that they don't really appreciate our standing in the world. And what uh, Dennis Richardson was saying was that, uh, was pointing out that of the 193 countries that make up the United Nations, Australia is the sixth largest in land area. We have the 13th or 14th largest economy with 19 years of uninterrupted growth. Our currency, the Australian dollar, is the fifth most, most traded in the world. And we have uh, the 13th or 14th largest uh, defence budget in the world. Also, and more importantly, particularly given our engagement in South Asia, within the next four years, Australia will become the seventh or eighth largest aid, aid donor in the world. We've doubled our foreign aid over the last five years, and we're on track to doubling it again by 2015. So acknowledging our relative, relative standing in the world, and as we look west to our South Asian partners with whom we share a stake in the Indian Ocean, we naturally want to be part of uh, the story of the development of that region. Turning, a bit, turning to India more specifically, um, the call for Australia to look west to South Asia and beyond takes place at a time when the relationships between the United States, China, Japan and India will provide the, the backdrop to much of what unfolds in the Indo-Pacific very much like the Cold War provided the backdrop to the second half of the 20th century. In this new and uncertain global landscape, Australia is actively seeking to increase its engagement with, with key South Asian partners, and in particular with India. As uh, no doubt most of you to the, here today will be familiar, and I guess there's not many ac experts in this room, India has emerged in recent years as a significant global power, both politically and economically, and is playing an increasingly important role in the security of our region. By 2030, India is projected to overtake China as the country with the world's largest population, and some forecast that India will be the world's third largest economy by 2025. Over the past few years, the Australian government has moved towards placing India firmly in the front, of, in the front rank of its uh, international partnerships. And this is a clear recognition of the implications of India's rise for Australia's own national interests. Shared values, our commitment to democracy, pluralism, human rights and the rule of law make Australia and India natural partners in addressing the very, uh, a myriad of international challenges. Two years ago, in November 2009, the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and uh, Prime Minister Singh agreed to lift the bilateral relationship to the level of a strategic partnership to reflect the strong convergence of interests and values that the two countries share. This strategic partnership includes cooperation on trade and investment, security, climate change, science, education, resources and energy. Since the time of uh, the two Prime Ministers meeting in November 2009, we've had extensive, an extensive number of uh, two-way ministerial visits. There have been 17 from India to Australia and 24 from Australia to India. We've substantially expanded our diplomatic presence in India. We've opened two consulates, one in Mumbai and one in Chennai. In 2011, this year, earlier this year, I think it was in July this year, we launched uh, negotiations on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement that will hopefully come to benefit the growing trade we have with, with, uh, between Australia and India. However, as Dennis Richardson, the Secretary of our Department, noted a few weeks ago in early November, we have yet to develop a genuine strategic partnership with India, and our, trade and our trading relationship remains far too narrowly based. So the potential for growth is quite great. In 2008, our then Minister for Foreign Affairs, Stephen Smith, compared the uh, compared Australia's early approaches to India as very much like a 2020 cricket match. Short bursts of enthusiasm followed by lengthy periods of inactivity. And I guess there were reasons for this. Um, there was a very high level of engagement with, uh, between Australia and India in the early to mid-90s, but these were truncated by uh, India's nuclear tests. But as Stephen Smith said back in 2008, what is now needed was to treat the relationship like a test match and work with diligence, dedication, application and perseverance day in and day out to extend the partnership. Um, somebody mentioned uranium. I'm not really sure what kind of cricket an analogy you would, uh, you would apply to Prime Minister Gillard's recent challenge to uh, 
for the Australian Labor Party to reverse uh, the Labor Party's ban on exporting uranium to India. But that will be debated uh, shortly at the ALP's National Congress, uh, a national conference that's held uh, in uh, the next month in December. Anyway, irrespective of how that uranium debate plays out, Australia is well positioned to partner with India through exports of minerals and fuels, energy investment opportunities in Australia, and collaborations of, uh, of areas of joint interest. A central element of India's foreign policy agenda is, is energy diplomacy, which relates to the need to secure energy supplies to meet the rapidly growing industrial and consumer demand. India's projected uh, energy needs as the world's sixth largest energy consumer are enormous and with Australia's LNG, with our coal and our uranium, we are already a significant energy exporter. We're also a significant exporter of agricultural produce. So we have a lot of what India has, uh, India wants and India and the rest of the world will want in the, in the 21st century. Just on some, uh, very briefly on some trade figures, two-way Two-way uh, goods and services trade uh, in 2009-10 between Australia and India totaled around 22.3 billion uh, Australian dollars. India was Australia, Australia's third largest export market in, in that period in 2009-10, up from fourth place in 2008-09. Australian merchandise ex exports to India reached 18.3 billion US, Australian dollars in, in 2010, up from around 14.5 billion. Uh, Australian dollars in 2009, and that represents about 7.4% of Australia's total merchandise exports. Although the trade relationship is dominated by merchandise trade, the role of services trade is, is growing. Australia exported around $3.6 billion worth of services to India in 2009-10, and uh, new prospects uh, continue to emerge in sectors such as ICT, biotechnology, education, tourism, health, industry and, uh, in, and, in, and in insurance. Education exports to India in 2009 totaled around 3.1 billion Australian dollars, with India being the second largest source of international students studying in Australia. Australian investment in India in 2009 totaled around just over 3 billion Australian dollars, including two, 278 million in direct investments and around $2 billion in portfolio investment assets. And these investments covered various sectors, manufacturing, telecommunications, hotels, minerals processing, food processing, oil and gas, and the automotive sector. The Indian community in Australia now numbers over 300,000 people and is making, a and all of them are making a very valuable contribution to building uh, the Australian society. Partly in recognition of uh, this developing relationship, 2012 has been designated as the Year of Australia in India. Turning to the multilateral area and the cooperation between Australia and, and, and India, I think over the past decade our bilateral ties with India have been both intensified and strengthened through the engagement in multilateral fora. The East Asia Summit and the, through the East Asia Summit and the G20 our two Prime Ministers meet uh, regularly at least twice a year and of course this could extend to three times a year if uh, India were to join APEC. Uh, Australia has been a firm supporter of uh, India's membership of APEC and likewise we, uh, we've also been a supporter of India becoming a permanent member of the reformed United Nations uh, Security Council. Australia has worked closely with India in the G20 to frame and implement a a global policy response to the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009 and this close cooperation in the G20 uh, is focused on putting in place measures to support a recovery from the Eurozone, Eurozone and Bond crisis and broader mechanisms for sustainable economic growth, economic global growth. The G20 is a is particularly important forum for multilateral cooperation because its membership includes both India and China. And this reflects a rebalancing of the global architecture to reflect new economic and strategic uh, realities. In, indeed, in 20 years, India and China have grown so fast they've almost tripled their share of the global economy and increased their absolute economic size almost ninefold. Together, they constitute almost a fifth of the global economy and are likely to represent a third of the global economy in the next two decades. 
Moving on to uh, some of the uh, some of our other engagements with South Asia, uh, another concrete example of our increasing engagement is the fact that our Parliamentary Secretary for Pacific Islands Affairs, um, Richard Miles, found himself representing Australia at the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation summit that was held in the Maldives uh, earlier this month, earlier in November. Um, I had the pleasure of. Uh, uh, talking to Mr. Miles uh, on his way into and out of those meetings and uh, he uh, certainly uh, is enthusiastic about uh, uh, translating some of his experience in the, in the Pacific to, uh, to uh, the small island countries of the, of the Indian Ocean. One of the hazards of being uh, the Australian High Commissioner in Singapore is that uh, Singapore is uh, the transit route for ministers both leaving and going back into Australia. So uh, we have a permanent uh, presence out at the VIP terminal at Changi. But it does give an opportunity to, to talk to our ministers and our parliamentary secretaries. At, the, uh, at this SARC summit, Mr Miles highlighted Australia's commitment to the region's infrastructure and growth initiative, which aims to improve regional in infrastructure connectivity in South Asia. This contribution recognises the fact that the region suffers from a severe lack of intra-regional connectivity between, na between national road networks, unrealised potential for rail and inland water freight transport, and inadequate road and rail connectivity of ports in the hinterlands. Of course, Australia is not alone in, uh, in this region in its support for greater connectivity. Uh, um, the ASEAN connectivity drive that's being pushed by, uh, by Singapore in particular Australia is very supportive of uh, this and uh, is doing a lot, lot to uh, promote and be engaged in, uh, in uh, ASEAN's connectivity uh, initiatives. And these were endorsed, I think most people know, by the East Asia Summit uh, at its meeting uh, last month, or earlier this month. Turning to, uh, to climate change, one of the challenges that uh, a number of regions of the world face um, in his, in his address to the SARC summit, Mr. Miles uh, noted that there is much that can be shared in the experiences, experiences of small island states in the Pacific, with whom Australia is very closely engaged, and small island states in the Indian Ocean. One particular area of shared concern and engagement between island states of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, of course, is how best to deal with these challenges that are posed, that are posed by climate change. We believe we're well, faced, well placed to facilitate this cross-regional engagement. We well understand the pressures facing small, low-lying islands in the Pacific. And in South Asia, we are acutely aware of the threat posed to the Maldives, for example, in uh, rising sea levels. We're, we are a constructive player with our South Asian partners and others in international deliberation, deliberations through the UNFCCC and we accept our responsibility as an advanced developed country with high per capita emissions. So through our active middle power diplomacy in the Cartagena group, we are doing our best to bridge the developed versus the developing country gap that runs the risk of seriously undermining UNFCC uh, negotiations. Australia takes seriously the science of climate change, as uh, should all states with vital interests in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And the recent release of a special uh, report by the uh, IPCC shows again that globally climate change can result in unprecedented extreme weather and climate events. In South Asia, Bangladesh is one of the most natural disaster prone countries in the world and amongst the most vulnerable to climate change and the growing frequency and severity of natural disasters. The World Disaster Report of 2010 revealed that more than 154 million Bangladeshis were affected by natural disasters between 1990 and 2009. The UNDP have further noted that projected sea level rises will directly affect the lives of 35 million people living in the coastal areas of Bangladesh by 2050. As part of our commitment, as part of Australia's commitment under the Copenhagen Accord, to provide fast start assistance to, to developing countries, particularly least developed countries and small island states. Australia is helping Bangladesh build its resilience to the impacts of climate change and natural disasters, especially the risks posed by rising sea levels and tidal surges. We are working with the Government of Bangladesh through two main programs. The first, the Bangladesh Climate Change Resilience Fund, 
and the second, the Com Comprehensive Disaster Management Program. Our active middle power diplomacy on confronting climate change is not just about mitigation. Australia is also focused on how we can secure our shared global economic future through de transici transitioning to low carbon growth. For this reason, the Gillard government recently passed clean energy legislation with a carbon tax as its centrepiece. And this is about Australia adopting a forward-looking approach to the changing economic landscape aimed at reaping the benefits of the low carbon growth model. Turning to our relationship with Afghanistan and um, our active engagement in some of the most unstable parts of South Asia is not just about supporting our alliance with the United, uh, with the United States. It's also about pursuing our national interests through a strategic approach to our, to our overseas aid or, or development program. As Mr Rudd noted to the Australian Parliament on 23 November this year, Australia's aid, aid program, program is an integral, integral part of our broader foreign and security policy objectives. And these objectives are to maintain our national security, build our national prosperity, and act as a good international citizen in building a stable and just international rules-based order. Within this framework, the fundamental purpose of Australian aid is to help people overcome poverty. This also serves Australia, Australia's national interest by promoting stability and prosperity in our region and beyond. A prominent contribution Australia is making to the South Asian region is our active commitment to international security in Afghanistan. This is testament to the premium we put on contributing to peace and stability, not just in South Asia but globally. It also reflects the centrality of our alliance with the United States and its continuing role as a global leader in our foreign policy settings. In Afghanistan, we are firmly committed to the evolution of a functioning state that is able to assume responsibility for preventing the country from ever again being a safe haven for terrorists. This commitment is broadly based as part of the UN-mandated International Security Assistance Force to train and mentor the Afghan National Army's 4th Brigade to help improve governance in, in Uruzgan province and to improve the provision of basic services to the people of the province. Australia has made, made clear security gains, gains which, gains which no, n nonetheless remain at risk and we are on track for transition to an Afghan security lead in, in Uruzgan province. On the aid front, uh, Australia is supporting basic health and hygiene education, which is provided to uh, around 8,000 primary school students, 34% of whom are girls. Our, our program is also enabling community demining and mine risk education, with over 100 Afghans having now been trained and over a uh, quarter of a million square metres of contaminated land being cleared. In 2008 and, and between 2008 and 2012, I was able to support local employment in building over 30 kilometres of roads, two bridges and municipal, municipal works in district centres. Moving on to, our, on to Pakistan briefly, um, Australia also recognises that continued support for Pakistan is important given the scale of its development challenges and its pivotal place in the security of the region. Australia is committed to working with the Government of Pakistan to address key development challenges affecting its stability as well as to support its recovery from the devastating floods of 2010 and 2011. Last October, Mr Rudd and Pakistan's Minister for Foreign Affairs strengthened cooperation between the two countries with the signing of the Australian-Pakistan Development Partnership. This partnership commits both countries to accelerate progress towards the Millennium Development Goals. It will underpin activities in the health, in the health education and agriculture and rural, rural development sectors. An annual dialogue has been established between senior officials from Australia and Pakistan to review uh, progress against jointly agreed development commitments. Australia's support is also helping around 28,000 children return to schooling following the 2010 floods and has provided seeds and fertiliser and more than 30,000 uh, to, 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 to more than 30,000 farmers to help restore crops and livelihoods following the floods. 
Australia's also invested in research programs that have improved farming techniques and increased farmers' incomes in the mango, dairy, citrus sectors, and has, a recent, and has recently awarded 50 development scholarships for Pakistani nationals to study in Australia in 2012. The multifaceted character of this development partnership is replicated in different ways in our development cooperation uh, partnerships with Nepal, Bhutan, the Maldives and, uh, and in Bangladesh. Let me turn briefly to, to Sri Lanka and really just one issue sh with Sri Lanka which I think underpins uh, the relationship, uh, at least part of the relationship we have with, with uh, Sri Lanka. As most of you will be aware, a central pre preoccupation of Australia's foreign policy has been informed uh, by the, um, and has been informed by the, the, the fairly intense uh, domestic political focus is the threat to Australia's national security interests posed by irregular immigration and uh, people smuggling. Australia has worked closely with, Sri with the Sri Lankan government and other regional partners in combating people smuggling. We, Australia has appreciated the good work uh, that has been undertaken by the Sri Lankan police and navy to disrupt and, uh, the dangerous and illegal people smuggling trade. Uh, we work uh, closely together, the two governments work closely together to prevent sm people smuggling and to explain the dangers of people smuggling to vulnerable communities in Sri Lanka. In September this year, our High Commissioner in, uh, in Colombo noted that the effective effectiveness of Sri Lankan security forces coordinated work had been demonstrated by the fact that no boat had reached Australia from Sri Lanka since November 2009, uh, touch wood. Um, we may not see eye to eye with the government of Sri Lanka on other issues, but, uh, but on the issue of uh, people smuggling, uh, the two countries have worked closely together and continue to work closely together. There's probably a lot more I could say about uh, our engagement with the countries of South Asia. It is a very large and diverse collection of states and uh, as I said uh, very early on in, the, in my presentation, uh, uh, much of our engagement uh, is focused on promoting Australia's national interest and, uh, and those interests, whether they're security interests or economic interests, uh, very much underpin our relationship with, uh, with South Asia and, uh, and the countries uh, of South Asia. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier, and I should highlight, and I think this is uh, this is uh, an issue that does focus the minds of most Australians, and that is that uh, it is estimated today that 80% of the global cricket economy is based in South Asia. And I think uh, I think um, our parliamentary secretary, Mr. Miles, noted this in his presentation at the SARC meeting. And that statistic can be, is, uh, as he said, uh, there can be no more dramatic statistic than this to focus the Australian mind about the power and potential of South Asia in every f field of human endeavour. Um, speaking of cricket, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite any of you uh, here today to be, pres to be present at, a, uh, a, at a, a cricket match on the 28th of January next year, when the Australian High Commission and the Singapore High Commission, uh, uh, sorry, the Indian, uh, sorry, the Indian High Commission, come together for a, uh, for a game of cricket, uh, either at the, uh, the cricket club or the Culling uh, uh, Cricket Ground. Um, I'm sure somebody will have a, a book on, a betting book on, uh, on the archive. <laughs> but um, if you are free on the 28th of January, we will be advertising and giving everyone details of this. But um, yeah, coming together through sports uh, is a great and underappreciated tool of, uh, of, uh, of public diplomacy. So uh, we'll see how we go next. Uh, Next, uh, next year. It will be a, a competitive game, no doubt, but uh, one with uh, plenty of fun and uh, enjoyment. Uh, with that, can I thank you for allowing me to uh, give this very brief presentation on our relations with, uh, with South Asia and the countries of South Asia, and I'm happy to uh, try and field uh, any questions uh, you may have. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner, and the match will be third ball of the first over will be a no ball. Uh, I, 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 think third, that. I think it's the third and fourth ball of the second over, I think is what we're okay. arranging. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, on behalf of uh, all of us at ISAS, I want to thank you for what was an extremely comprehensive presentation of Australia's uh, 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 engagement uh, with uh, South Asia. India in particular, of course, given, given the importance of India in, in the system, but uh, not just India, but with the rest of South Asia as well. And you have also given a, 
an analytical account of how Australia sees itself, uh, much in the way Kevin Rudd has spoken, had spoken as in, uh, not just a one ocean, but a two ocean state. Uh, and underscoring the point, uh, and no one can dispute that, that being a good international citizen redounds to the interest of, uh, of any country in the global system, political system. With that, I open the floor to comments, questions, remarks, and uh, the High Commissioner has uh, agreed to respond to those. Yes, uh, Professor Jeffrey. Could you, um, could you go into a bit of detail about the government's position on the uh, decision to quarter U.S. troops in Darwin, or at least to run a constant flow of up to 1,500 U.S. troops through Darwin on, a, I gather, a kind of regular basis, so there'll be an American troop presence in Australia. What, what's the rationale, and uh, when will that begin? The, the, the background to it? Um, well, the background is uh, as a result of uh, the U U.S. force posture review and um, and uh, the engagement the U.S. has had with Australia on that and how the U.S. will, uh, as, uh, as uh, the U.S. has indicated, as they wind down from uh, conflicts in, uh, in uh, the Middle East and South Asia, that uh, they will have capacity and, uh, and uh, uh, assets to be repositioned around around the world. We have an alliance relationship with the United States. We already do a lot with the United States, uh, with exercises and, uh, and so on, and uh, the Australian government sees this as just a natural extension of that, uh, that relationship, that uh, those, uh, the Marines, a small number of Marines will, uh, will transit through Darwin and uh, there'll be joint training exercises, um, just, as, uh, just as happens now, but, uh, but uh, where they come just for the exercise itself. It's probably very, very similar to what happens in a number of countries in this region, with, uh, with Singapore, with, uh, for example, having um, uh, US ships uh, transiting through Changi on a regular, regular basis. Any reaction to that? Yeah. No, simply that it, to have troops on the ground is a, it seems to be quite a substantial departure from anything that's happened since the Second World War in terms of a regular American troop presence, which yeah. raises South Korea and Japan and Okinawa. Yeah, no, but it's not a, as, as, as has been made very clear, it's not a base. It's not basic. Mm -hmm. So it's not a US base being developed in Darwin. It's mm -hmm. troops transiting in and out. But there have been installations in Australia before. The, 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 uh, 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 not Box Three Downs, the... Uh, uh, Monitoring. Yes, pine, there's a pine, pine, pine gap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? Pine gap. Pine, pine gap, yes. Yeah. But of course, um, this, these things like this always get headlines, but um, mm. uh, the, uh, the opening of a joint Australian-Chinese uh, space uh, observation uh, post in Australia uh, this year got no headlines. It's interesting, isn't it? Rather yes. than in the paper, in the Australian newspapers this week. Okay, we'll go in this order. Uh, um, you, you spoke about uh, foreign, foreign aid, basically how it's becoming a major component of Australia's foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, with the emergence of China and India's net donors, do you think uh, it will in any way undermine Australia's efforts in aid uh, with regard to South Asia? That's one question. Uh, the other question is that you said that uh, now Australia recognizes the fact that it's a two-ocean nation. <coughs> so where does the TPP initiative sort of fit into that equation? And do you think that TPP can sort of redefine Asian regionalism to that extent? On the first one, on the first uh, question on uh, Australia's aid, I mean, uh, our view is that uh, uh, the more the merrier, as far as aid. We don't uh, see it as a comp we don't see it as a competition. Um, I think the more money that is available, the more, more resources that, that are available to assist uh, countries to, uh, you know, to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, the better. So we've never seen aid as, a, as really a, a, a competition, if it is genuine, genuine uh, development assistance. A TPP, you mean the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Um, um, well, I mean, I think that the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is, a, is filling a void, in, in my view, that uh, um, things aren't happening in Geneva, they aren't happening in the World Trade Organization, and uh, we have a number of like-minded countries that uh, want to further open up markets and, uh, 
and uh, reduce barriers and they're getting together to uh, to negotiate a, a very high level um, or the, the plan is to have a very high level very very ambitious 21st century kind of uh, trade agreement and um, it's uh, very much an open uh, uh, arrangement that uh, countries other countries are able to uh, to uh, to participate in it uh, so long as there is consensus amongst the existing members uh, for them to uh, to join they have to be able to you know, commit to the aspirations of the original group of members. Whether that will extend beyond uh, the Pacific, uh, I don't think there's been any real specular, you know, a, a discussion of that amongst the, the, those that are negotiating at the moment. Okay. Uh, uh, so much focus on this uh, two ocean nation, mm. as Australia calls itself these mm. days. Does Australia plan to have uh, coordinated the uh, naval exercises with, say, not just the U.S., but also India, just as Japan, India, and the U.S. do. Mm. Is there any plan? There has been discussions on it, but I'm just not sure where that's, uh, where that's up to. There have been discussions on possible uh, naval exercises, but I, I'm not aware whether they have, in fact, taken place yet. That's probably also cooperation. The Gulf of Aden. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware, but it's certainly, uh, just as we do, um, again, uh, this is a point I should make, um, again, it doesn't get any headlines, but uh, we talk about our military exercises with, uh, with the United States under our clear, well-known alliance, but um, um, tomorrow there'll be Australian military personnel doing an exercise, a joint um, military exercise with the PLA in China, on the ground in China. Uh, but that doesn't get, uh, well, hopefully it does get some publicity tomorrow when the, when the images appear on the televisions around the world. But, and we've done a number of naval exercises with China as well. Down to, we've done two, in fact, one in, one in Australia with a ship, uh, at the time of a ship visit, and then subsequently up in uh, Chinese waters. We did live firing exercises with the Chinese, um, Chinese Navy. So we do, you know, it's um, often, these things are always painted as a, as an either or, and uh, in reality, they're not an either or. But uh, our relationship, military relationships with China, are developing to the point now that we do have a, we have an exercise, as I said, starting tomorrow, with uh, uh, Australian Army personnel in uniform, exercising with PLA uh, military in uniform on mainland China. It's interesting if you have exercises with China, Indonesia, and India. Uh, one might well argue what is the point in <laughs> having a navy in the first place because all three were identified in, 19, uh, in, the, in the white paper as potential adversaries. But of course that was routine. We're, we're, worried, about, we're worried about Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pallet, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhry. Uh, Your Excellency, I uh, joined Dr. Chaudhry in uh, thanking you for coming to ISAS. And I wanted to share with you a little bit of an experience which we had recently when we travelled to Australia from our institute and some of the impressions that we came back with. Uh, the impression that I got, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that within the Australian academic, strategic, as well as business communities, there is obviously a very strong urge to engage a lot more with India in South Asia. And uh, there, is, there is a vacuum in so far as the available body of expertise in Australia is concerned. So to that extent, there is this uh, uh, very strong urge to connect to people and uh, uh, agencies. But there's one uh, thought that we left with that uh, we, we obviously know that the extent of Australia's economic relationship with China is very deep and very symbiotic, and that really cannot be compared with the Australia-India relationship as of now, in a purely economic terms. But what we thought was that the urge expressed to connect with India of South Asia is not really getting reflected in as much of resources we would have wanted to be seen to move into, say, India studies or South Asian studies or similar efforts, whereas probably there is a greater uh, allocation of resources insofar as China studies are concerned. Uh, do you think this might change? I mean, we are aware of probably initiatives like the Australia-India Institute, which have now, and we do have strong interactions with them. 
But at the same time, what we were wondering and ourselves was that unless there is a dedicated volume of government support and resources going into India and South Asian studies, there's probably little possibility of you know, that scholarship or that expertise or that knowledge becoming available among the Australian agencies and institutes. What is your thought on this? Yeah, well, I think your assessment is spot on. I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, you're right in, in saying that it is, it is underdone compared to uh, what's happening with, uh, with China. But I, I'd point to uh, you know, the number of speeches and, uh, that, I, that I highlighted earlier by the Foreign Minister, Kevin Rudd, uh, over the last uh, six months, where there is now a, clearly a push at the federal government level for greater understanding, greater interaction. And I think, like most things in Australia, a lot of the, they, they, are, they are led a large degree by the federal government and, uh, and uh, the initiatives that they take. Uh, and uh, I would be hopeful that uh, as time goes on, that, that that intense level of engagement we're seeing now at the political level will continue. And as a result of that, there will be much greater and more greater resources being earmarked by the federal government to uh, uh, the pursuit of academic studies and so on with, uh, with India and the rest of South Asia. I see it, I guess it's probably a, it's probably a little bit where the relationship or the focus on China was um, 20 years ago, maybe. And uh, as I said earlier, I think um, there were very strong prospects in the early 90s of uh, of increased engagement between Australia and India, and they were, you know, I guess, put in the deep freeze a bit by the nuclear tests, and we lost a number of years of, uh, of building that momentum until I think early, early what, 2001, I think, was when? 2000. 2000? Yes, August. Yeah. Oh, 2000. So, so we lost, what, about two or three years? Things were really looking good uh, in 96, 97, and then it went. So I think uh, I, that have, that didn't help. I don't think, and that's I think we're we're suffering from that at the moment. Uh, but I'd be hopeful that uh, that this focus will continue, uh, followed by the private sector engagement with, at the business level, and we are seeing greater greater Indian Indian investment in in Australia. I mean, a, a, a statistic worth bearing in mind that. Sixty uh, percent of the investment in the Australian resources sector is by overseas investors and uh, and we're seeing an inc increasing amount of investment from Singapore in the resources sector and in other uh, sectors in Australia so I can see that also helping to shape uh, what happens in Australia. As a, as a follow-up to this I think that's a uh, you know, really state of the facts very comprehensive. As a follow-up to this I was just wondering that uh, as an economist, what I think, other than the resource you know, related engagement, education is providing a major push mm -hmm. uh, between the engagement between the two countries. Do you think that is a fact that is uh, taken note of by the strategic and the diplomatic community? That education can really serve as a major, major medium? Um. Well, the, my, the answer to that is, is yes, but, um, but there are, I think there are gaps in people's appreciation in, uh, in, in the value of, of education. There are gaps. But funda fundamentally, certainly the, the state governments and the federal government generally accept the value of education in developing those things. And that's why we, you know, we have we have so many students coming into Australia from, uh, from India. I think it's the, it's the second largest source of, of foreign students into Australia behind China. Yeah. But with China, of course, there were drivers in the system, like Gough Whitlam. I mean, he'd gone to China as a leader of opposition, Stephen Fitzgerald, who, who dedicated much of his early uh, academic thing to, to the pursuit of uh, relations with China. So perhaps with India, you need that kind of... Uh, uh, drive and enthusiasm mm. from selected quarters, both in the government and, yeah. and uh, the academia. Look, but I think we're Stephen seeing Smith, that. Stephen Smith, the former foreign minister, mm. big advocate yeah. of relations with India. Absolutely. And, and that's been followed up by Kevin Rudd. I, well, Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister and now as Foreign Minister. But you're right, Stephen Smith did uh, 
go out of his way. I mean, he would say, you know, when he wakes up in the morning and opens the window and looks out, he's looking towards India, not, not, uh, not the United States. I mean, he lives in Perth. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought in Canberra it would be difficult. To... <laughs> um, I know there's been a very strong push from Australia. I've been visiting for quite some time. Uh, the last 20 or more years, since China really started liberalizing in 1980, the entire focus has been China. Is there any shift in the attitude of Beijing now that you are now trying to balance your focus a little bit more broader based than strictly a China focus, both politically and economically? So, if in China or in... Yeah, what is the reaction from Beijing to the recent moves that Australia is making now to, towards South Asia, towards having a US presence in Darwin? Do, they, do we have any reactions from the, from the Chinese? Because there has been a privileged relationship between Australia and China on, on many fronts for the last 25 years or more? Not, uh, not what I would call some significant reactions, no. Okay. Fairly muted yeah. reactions. Let's yeah. follow up on the education one, since I've come from that sector. Um, <coughs> it Are you from the High Commission, sir? No. I, I'm Peter Bond from the Australian International School. Oh, okay. um, That's not a Dorothy Dixon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, it seems to me anecdotally that there's a decline in the numbers of international students going to Australia to study. That the universities in Australia are finding it difficult to fill the sort of quotas that they've got. And there could be some, some factors around that. Whereas we know that in, in India that the, the number of students who are seeking to undertake tertiary education far exceed the number of, of places available. Um, so that, that sort of economic education you know, combination is certainly an attractive one for Australia, but we don't seem to capitalise on it to the extent that we ought to go. Yeah, I mean, the, the tertiary education sector of overseas students has gone through, as we all know, has gone through a number of reviews over the last two, three years. And, uh, and I, I think we've yet to see the, the final washout of that. But, uh, but ultimately, then I would expect the number of international students will remain around the same. I mean, the universities can't keep uh, increasing the numbers uh, unchecked. They just don't have the, the, the resources to teach um, an ever-ending number of, uh, of, uh, of student enrolment. So, but my understanding is numbers are reasonably, well, reasonably stable. They're not as high as they as they were, but uh, but uh, still, but still acceptable to most Australian universities. That's my nice. so There have been quite some significant changes in the visa requirements of work. Well, there has. I mean, with uh, and there were some problems with uh, there were there were some problems that identified a couple of years ago, where um, particularly with uh, uh, vocational education uh, uh, went unchecked. Uh, students coming in for to be hairdressers and cooks to get a, a, a an immigrant a residency outcome as a re, at the end of it, and that caused a, a significant you know significant amount of problems, and that's now been now been addressed. So we've seen a reduction in the number of uh, students coming in to the, the vet, the vocational education and training sector uh, because of the uh, the uh, the crackdown on that. It was essentially, it was an unintended consequence. You come to do a 12-month training course to be a hairdresser and end up with a res permanent residency outcome at the end of it. So that's been that's been dealt with. But overall, the you know, the tertiary, you know, the university sector is, seems to be performing quite well. Raj Shigetli. Yeah. Um, <coughs> my question concerns. Uh, the decision by Australia to now sell uranium, uranium to India, uh, despite the fact that India has not signed the NPT, uh, what has prompted this, this 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 policy change, if I may call it that? Because I remember way back in 1998 when I was at ANU, when we India had conducted the tests. I think Australia was one of the more uh, you know uh, vociferous yeah. critic of India's, and I sort of see now this. 
Well, I should clarify, it's not a policy change. Um, the Australian government is still opposed to selling uranium to India because they're not a signatory of the NPT. What the Prime Minister has said, and she said this as a member of the Labor Party, the governing party, that she would like uh, the Labor Party to, um, to change its policy. Now, so it's, not a, it's, a, it's a party. She's saying that as a member of the party, not as the Prime Minister of, of Australia, if you understand. So there's no change in government policy. There's no change in the Labor Party policy. Um, she has asked for a debate at the National Conference, which takes place in December, in the next couple of weeks. And if, well, we don't know, I don't know how that debate's going to, going to uh, uh, come out. Uh, there may be no change to the Labor Party policy, and therefore status quo, or the Labor Party might make a change, or with conditions, who knows. So it's, it's not a government, this is not an Australian government position, it's a party debate at the moment. It's not an issue with Pakistan, uh, is it? Uh, I mean, uh, what about Pakistan then? I mean, if it's still a pro if it's a, but it's a proposal. It's something that no, no. Is like Would Pakistan want to procure uh, uh, uranium from Australia if India, uh, if the this thing, uh, ban on India is revoked? I don't know. Uh, no, I, I think the ambassador in Canberra did say that. Did he? Uh, made a comment the day after Prime Minister Gillard to that effect. Yes. But I think my understanding is that what, well, what Prime Minister Gillard has said publicly is that it's time to relook at the effectiveness. Of, of the policy, the, the Labor Party policy, and whether it's actually achieving its goals or, or, or whether it's kind of redundant. But I think the way the media reported it, one thought that actually one could see a change yeah. in Australia. Do you know what the media is like? <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to uh, people in the room. Uh, just, as a follow, uh, just as a follow up to that, yeah. I'm just curious because we've had this NPT issue where India did not get any <laughs> support from the United States in terms of export restrictions and so on because of that. And after George Bush, the second one, and Clinton Bush, and then with Obama loosening it up, has there been kind of an uh, intervention with suppliers uh, to the nuclear power industry to say, well, you know, we the United States have kind of agreed that, you know, India would not uh, do anything dramatic that could uh, cause concern. Mm. Therefore, we are willing to open up, so you should. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean, I just need to make sure I explain this correctly. I mean, Australia has been a supporter in the uranium suppliers group. And, uh, you know, we've not stood in the way of uh, other supplies uranium to India. It's just a fact that the party that governs Australia, their platform, is opposed to the sale of uranium to people who are countries that aren't signatories to the NPT. That's just a fact of the, the party platform. And therefore, the government, the government of that party cannot go against their party platform. That's the, so that's where we're at. So Australia is not against uh, the United States, Canada, or anyone else supplying uranium to India. We supported um, the discussions in the uh, USG, it's just that, you know, as I say, it's a part of the, the governing party's platform. Just as they have, you know, uh, uh, positions on other issues. Uh, the other one, the other con controversial one being debated is uh, is uh, same-sex marriages. So um, it'll be on the agenda as well, whether the party currently opposes same-sex mar marriages, it will be debated to see whether um, the party may relax its position. Uh, just following up one more yeah. time. Sorry. Yeah, okay. uh, there has been a lot of tension in Australia with India's expansion, naval expansion, mm. a few, I mean, about seven, ten years ago. As a matter of fact, there was a great deal of concern uh, that India was trying to develop a blue, nav blue ocean mm. capability. Has that attitude essentially shifted now, or is it still in process? No, I, I believe it has shifted. Yes. We don't see the same. Uh, the same level of uh, debate, discussion on that. Blue water capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, any more questions, remarks, comments? And if there be none, it is my very pleasant duty to 
etch ourselves in your minds forever <laughs> by giving you this token of our appreciation. And all of us uh, will now uh, repair to the afternoon tea. <laughs>